All right. Yeah, today's talk is going to be about the yeah the fundamentals of, of quantum computing and quantum machine learning. So I've, I wanted to to do this talk for a while now because um, yeah, quantum computing is one of the pillars of of ML two R, and so far there are only few people working on that. So, and and I think there are also quite some misconceptions uh, about quantum computing and it's it's all in all quite vague topic and um, I just wanted to shed some light on that and um, give a little introduction. So my title is quantum computing for confused computer scientists and I hope I can clear up some of this confusion. Um, all right. So to give you some motivation i brought you some pictures so these are always the kind of things you you will see at at conferences with some industry people presenting what they're doing in, in quantum computing so for example this is a cooling system it's a called it's called a dilation refrigerator and these kind of things are used to cool down stuff to like a few micro kelvins above absolute zero which is about 200 minus 273 degrees Celsius. Um, and these are needed in order to reach temperature. So, so these temperatures, um, at these temperatures, materials start to expose more and more quantum behavior. So we need these really low temperatures for, for quantum effects to be more stable. And inside of these refrigerators, you will find um, these so-called qubits or the chips like this. So in this case, this is um, a so-called transmon qubit um, chip built by IBM. And you can see these kind of transistor looking things are the qubits, which are then connected by these, by these quantum buses, I think they're called. So there are many different technologies in order to implement quantum computing. So this is not a single framework, but you can use different materials to create quantum effects and use quantum effects. So in this case, I think this is something with superconducting charges. I can't really tell you much about it because for me and for most, um, for most computer scientists, in fact, I think quantum computing is more or less a black box and the way it's actually implemented in nature, in physics is um, something that physics, uh, physicists have to worry about. So um, yeah, I think this one works with, um, with, with superconducting charges, but there are also photon-based quantum computers and all kinds of technologies. But the, the basic mathematical principle is um, more or less the same throughout. Um, but, but different technologies, of course, have different limitations and different levels of error and noise that are introduced. Um, yeah, but in today's talk, I'm going to mainly focus on the mathematical side, on the theoretical side of quantum computing. And you can see a little timeline of quantum computing. Um, so at the top, you see some results from theoretical research. At the bottom, some practical um, research results. So the first so the very first concepts of quantum computers overall already arose in the in the early 1980s and um the all the classical the classic uh, quantum algorithms that you know of today like Schwarz algorithm for prime factorization all arose somewhere around the 90s but back then there really was hardly any real physical quantum device available. So they're only, they were only starting to implement the very first quantum gates, but they really couldn't do hardly anything. It was very unthinkable to perform actually Schwarz algorithm on this hardware back then. And the picture is slowly starting to, to change. So in recent years, we had more development. Um, so I think currently the, currently the most advanced quantum computers have roughly over a hundred qubits. So qubits being the, the basic unit of quantum information, which I'm going to talk later in length about. Um, 
but um, there are different quality levels of qubits. So one qubit, if, if, a, if a company claims that it has a device with 128 qubits, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's 128 usable actual qubits, but rather multiple qubits are then combined to form one logical qubit, so to speak, because as I already said, these qubits are very error prone and noisy. And so you have to mitigate this and effectively state of the art methods. If you read papers, most, most experiments on real life um, quantum hardware actually have or use around at max 20 to 30 qubits maybe. So for example, for our paper, which, which we published a preprint of now in late December, together with, um, with Nico and, and other people from EIS, um, we, we conducted experiments with 10 and 20 qubits on actual IBM Q devices. So this is about the state of the art. Um, and one thing that, that is a little bit different from, from the so-called quantum gate paradigm, which I've talked about, which I'm talking about in this talk mainly, is, is um, quantum annealing. This is a different approach to quantum computing. And there we have a little higher numbers of qubits. So for example, the D-Wave 2000Q, this was um, the first um, commercially available quantum computer. And they claim to have 2000 qubits, but these are very different kinds of qubits. So they, they are, these devices can only solve these annealing problems. And you cannot, so there you can argue that, that quantum annealing and quantum gate computing are roughly equally um, expressive, but um, yeah, not really sure. So the numbers are different here. Yeah, and in very recent years, um, there have been first attempts at combining quantum computing with, quant uh, with machine learning. So a new field called quantum machine learning started arising. And yeah, people are trying to use the, the, the expressiveness of, of um, quantum computers or the, the computing power of quantum computers to do machine learning. And um, ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, and there are multiple approaches to this. So you often see in literature pictures like this, where um, you have different, you have either classical or quantum algorithms and you have either quantum or classical data. And in the top left corner, this is what we do every day. So this is classical data with classical algorithms. So normal machine learning as we know it. And then you can introduce quantum parts into it and the most the most researched part is, of course, this corner here, which is classical data um, using quantum algorithms. So using quantum computers to do classification or regression of a, of a normal classical data set. But of course, there are also other approaches. So I think this one is, is not very much research to, to, to use classical algorithms with quantum data. And finally, you can, you can go full quantum and use and perform some kind of quantum algorithms on, on quantum states or something. But yeah, the most research effort is, is put into this, this top right corner here actually. So we want to, so people are trying to use quantum algorithms to deal with data. And um, there has been kind of um, criticism as well. Um, so people are skeptical, uh, skeptical about um, um, quantum machine learning because so far it hasn't really produced any considerable advantage over classical machine learning. So for example, I have a quote here from Maria Schult, who's very active in this research area of uh, quantum machine learning. And she, for example, said, I think we haven't done our homework yet. This is an extremely new scientific field. This is one of the more optimistic quotes. So from this article, which I found here, there are more quotes, which are much more critical. So there's no really no situation up to now where you would decide as a company, for example, to use or, or where it would be sensible for a company to use a quantum computer instead of normal machine learning on, on like um, graphics cards or something. So yeah, this is, as I said, a really young research field 
and really groundbreaking or great, great breakthroughs are yet to come, probably, hopefully. <laughs> Um, okay, and most um, information you're going to hear in this talk is actually from these two books. On the left is Supervised Learning with Quantum Computers, which is actually written by Maria Schult and Francesco Petrucciona. And um, this, this contains really useful information about quantum machine learning, actually. So there are some examples of machine learning in this, how you can apply quantum computing to machine learning. And then this book here, um, which was recommended to me by Arno Siebes, um, which approaches the theoretical side of um, quantum computing from a linear algebra perspective. And of course, over the course of the past year, past one and a half years, there was also a lot of just Googling, reading papers involved. So let's come to the basics of quantum computing. So if you haven't read anything more specific about quantum computing, the, the um, the thing that most computer scientists probably think of is, well, usually you have zero and one as bits, which are the basic units of information, and quantum computing, computing just puts some kind of weird notation around it, and then you have access to everything in between. Uh, and, and the way computer scientists may think about this is like, okay, bits, bits are either zero or one, but now you can have everything in between. So it could be like 0 0.5 and then it's zero and one at the same time. This is typically the way people might think about this. And actually we are like, yeah, 70% there, but it's a little bit more complicated. And um, yeah, because actually you can access or the, the amount of information stored in a qubit is much higher than only only a single like floating value. So what is a qubit actually? So a qubit, so we were right in the assumption that it's some kind of, yeah, like linear interpolation maybe in a sense. So we have these, um, can you see my mouse cursor? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, you, you have some kind of basis states, zero and one. And then you have these factors, in this case, alpha zero and alpha one. And the sum of these two, so it looks like a linear interpolation is this quantum state. And um, so these brackets are by the way called um, cats. So you would read this as cat psi, psi is the Greek letter here and is equal to alpha zero times cat zero plus, etc. cetera. So, um, but this is not a normal linear interpolation, but actually these um, values, these alpha values are complex numbers and these are called amplitudes. Um, yeah, and zero and one, these are the so-called basis states. And what, these, what these, um, this bracket notation actually usually stands for is some kind of vector, some kind of state vector. Um, which is from a so-called Hilbert space. You often read the term Hilbert space in, in this literature. For our intents and purposes, Hilbert state is more or less synonymous with the complex space. So the basis states of a single qubit come from a two-dimensional complex space. So these are complex valued vectors. And um, for example, a single qubit, these basis states zero and one are like the canonical basis vectors of this complex state space. So one, zero and zero, one. You can think of this as like indicator vectors. So the first entry represents zero, the second entry represents one. So one, zero is zero and zero, one is one. And then of course you can just multiply this and add this together and then you can write this as this so-called amplitude vector. And an important requirement for this to work or for this to represent a valid qubit state is that these, this amplitude vector is normalized. So similar to a linear interpolation where the factors have to sum up to one, in this case, the squared, the absolute values of the amplitudes sum up to one. And um, yeah, of course, if, if you have vectors like this, one, zero or zero, one, then you are in a basis state, then this more or less 
an, uh, a classical bit as we know it. But if, if these are not these two basis vectors, if it's anything in between, then the qubit is said to be in a so-called superposition. And this means we are in some kind of in-between state. <clears throat> okay, questions so far? Okay, you can interrupt me at any time if you have questions. So just a quick excursion to complex numbers. I think most of you should be familiar with this, but just to, um, to recapitalize. So um, complex numbers um, are always a pair of numbers. So you have a real part and an imaginary part multiplied with this, with this um, imaginary unit, which is defined to be minus, so which is defined to be the square root of minus one. And the notion of complex conjugate is something you often see, which is just you flip the sign of the imaginary part. If you imagine complex numbers on a plane within a real axis and an imaginary axis, like the mirror image along the horizontal axis, this is the complex conjugate. And then finally, with this notion, we can define an absolute value of a, of a complex number um, as the distance to zero, which is at the center, if you imagine it's a plane. Um, and this is like, this is just the, the number itself multiplied with its complex conjugate and the square root. This is basically the same as a Euclidean norm on 2D, on the 2D real plane. And if you think about this, this, this definition actually holds also for real numbers because, but we don't think of it as a distance to zero usually. And yeah, I, this is, this is the, uh, the complex plane. So here you have the real axis and the imaginary axis. And here you have a complex number, a point. The complex conjugate would lie somewhere here. So the mirror image. And then these are a set of interesting numbers. Um, all of these numbers have unit distance to the origin, to zero. So all of their, their absolute values are, are one. You could think of it, um, if you have real numbers, they're only really two numbers that have distance one, but on the complex plane there, in, there's an infinite number of, of values with uh, distance one. And these have this shape, e to the i theta, and you can plug in any value for theta, any real value, and these will be all numbers with absolute value one. And in this case, this theta is, is called the phase. All right. And why am I telling you this specifically, just to, to tell this right now. So you can basically, if you have an amplitude vector, then you can multiply it with any e to the i theta term for any theta. You can, so basically, um, qubit amplitudes have some kind of phase information. Or you can, you can multiply them with any phase and it doesn't actually change the, the qubit state. So, and just to shed th um, some more light on this, on this bracket notation, because it's really one of the most um, confusing things for non-physicists. So this is, this is actually called the Dirac notation or also bracket notation. And um, as I already said, if this, if this angle bracket here points to the right, then this is basically just a column vector, a complex column vector. And if you, flip the direction of the bracket, if it points to the left, then this is a, a conjugate transpose of this vector. So then it's the conjugate values inside and it's a row vector. And another notation you often find in physics is this dagger. So if you write it as a normal vector, then it's the dagger is the same. And then of course you have the inner and outer product, which then look like this. So you just, it's just the intuitive definition. All right. One very neat way to visualize qubit states is the so-called block sphere. So here are some examples of valid um, qubit states, right? So we already saw one zero and zero one. These are the basic states, the basic states. And these are all valid qubit states because if you square the values, and then add them up, they're going to be one. So one over square root of two squared is one half plus one half is one. And similar for these. And now you see why this is more expressive than just using real numbers, because now you can also have negative numbers 
and also complex numbers here. So there are more degrees of freedom, so to speak, which are, which are valid qubit states. And um, now we can, we can represent this actually on the surface of a sphere. So, if you, so um, you can take a, a three-dimensional sphere and then the basis states zero and one sit at the poles. Oops. And actually every point on the surface of this sphere represents a valid qubit state. And you can define these using these two angles. And now you might ask, why are there only two angles when I just said that we have complex numbers and um, which have two degrees of freedom each. So in total, a qubit state should have four degrees of freedom. But, um, okay, we lose one degree of freedom by the requirement that these are normalized to one. And then, uh, as I told you, there is this global phase. You can, you can multiply to each qubit state. And if you imagine it, if you have a a complex number, you can always multiply it with a phase such that it is rotated onto the real axis and it is positive, right? So there's always a value we can multiply to it. So that we can say we just ignore this global phase because it isn't observable really and just, if, and just say um, the first entry of this amplitude vector is real and positive or non-negative non rather. And then we end up with these two degrees of freedom and here, here's a formula for calculating the, the, um, like the Cartesian representation, so to speak, from the angles. And this is a really useful visualization of a single qubit state. Um, questions about that so far? Okay. Yeah, what can we actually do or what do, do these um, amplitudes actually represent? So we can perform measurements and up here you can see the usual notation for this. So, so you often notate um, qubit operations using something that looks like a circuit diagram. So here at the end, at the, um, at the beginning is this initialization. So we start with this qubit state cat phi and this is the symbol for measurement. And when we measure a qubit, then we will never observe the actual amplitudes inside, but the qubit will so-called collapse to a basis state with the probability given by the square of the amplitudes. So for example, if we have this state, which is kind of boring because it is already a basis state, then we will observe a zero with probability one squared, which is one, and one with probability zero. So these are the probabilities for observing the basis states. Then we have this state, which is more interesting. So this is an equal superposition of zero and one. And if we square this, one over square root of two squared is one over two. So we have probability one over two for each state. So we, when we observe this repeatedly, we will observe both zero and one with the same probability. And finally, if we have this state here, so as you can see, this is the same as the one before, but now we have a negative sign. So you will actually observe the same probability, of course, because minus one over square root of two squared is still one over two. So the probabilities don't change, which is actually an important observation um, because there are, there are multiple states which result in the same observation. So the probabilities for these two states are the same, but the amplitudes are not. So there is some kind of additional information embedded in the qubit, which we cannot directly observe, but it's there and it is preserved over the course of a quantum computation. And this is really important. So there's really, really more degrees of freedom than just the probabilities. <clears throat> so what can we do now with the qubit? So we can, when we have a state, we can observe it, but we can also perform some kinds of operations with them. So 
Um, and these operations take the form of matrices naturally because um, the qubit states are vectors and operations and transformations on vectors are usually carried out through matrices. And um, right, if we have um, two dimensional amplitude vectors, these matrices will be of size two by two. And um, of course, if you think about it, if we have a valid qubit state, it will be normalized to sum of squares equals one. And afterwards, we, will, we have to end up in a valid qubit state as well. So the, the operations have to provide that this holds true, that after you apply it to the qubit state, the, um, the norm of this amplitude vector will be the same. And the class of matrices that fulfill this requirement are called unitary matrices. And they have the property that they, their inverse is just the same as their complex conjugate, uh, or their complex conjugate transpose, which is this dagger. So you take the transpose, take the um, conjugate, and then this is the same as its inverse. And for example, if we have again this, this zero state down here, then we can apply this unitary, this is a unitary matrix, which is called the X gate. And if you um, apply it to this state, then it just flips around these two, it just basically flips the amplitudes. And then we will end up in a, in a, in a one state here, if we start with zero. And similarly, if we start in a one state, so zero one, then we'll be in a, in a in the zero state at the end. So this is more or less like a logical or, uh, logical not, sorry, if you think about this, because it just inverts the state. But of course, because it is a matrix, we can apply it also to the in-between states, right? So it's not just a logical not, but actually a quantum not gate. And this slightly more interesting gate is the so-called Hadamard gate. And what this does, if you apply it to the zero state here, then it creates this equal superposition. So this is just a different notation for this state here. Yeah, this is the same, just written like this. And if you apply it to the one state, it creates this other type of um, equal superposition with the minus one, which we saw is when we observe it is the same as this one but actually it's a different state so with this gate you can you can like tilt a zero or one on its side so that it's an equal superposition there's a way to, to think about it all right so now so up to now we have just dealt with a single qubit which is really interesting on its own, but it becomes much more interesting if we add multiple qubits. So if we observe multiple qubits in a single system, the um, state space, of course, gets bigger. So because, which is also true for normal bits, right? So if you think about it, if you have one bit, you have two possible states. If you have two bits, you have four states, every combination. So the state space grows exponentially. And similarly, if you have multiple qubits, the state space will also grow exponentially. So for two qubits, you will need a four dimensional Hilbert space or complex space for us. For three qubits, you will need eight and so on. And um, the way you calculate the, the, um, the state space of a multi-qubit system is you take the so-called Kronecker product, which is this circled X operator. And it looks kind of weird, but um, it's, it's a really simple operation, actually. So you, you kind of you put a copy of the second factor in front of every entry of the first um, factor. So you kind of stretch out the first and put a copy behind everything. Then you multiply it out, and then you get, in, in this example, this bigger vector here. And the Kronecker product is fun because you, you can it basically you can basically plug in everything, a matrix or vector of any size, and you can, com can combine any sizes and it will work, unlike like the dot product and stuff. <laughs>
And of course you can generalize this for n qubits. You can form a bigger Kronecker product and the Kronecker product is also associative. And then you will end up for n qubits in a space of, of size two to the n. And this is exactly the reason why it's difficult to, to simulate quantum computing on classical computers, because it requires this huge amount of space for storing all the amplitude information. Because every entry of this is a complex number and you have exponentially many. If you add just one qubit, it gets double, as, double the size. All right. And yeah, just another look, another way to look at this, you can also pull the factors to the front and then form the, the um, Kronecker product over the combinations of the basis states. And then you, you basically get a similar representation to what we started with, with a single qubit. So you have amplitudes times bigger basis states. And these bigger basis states will then look like this. So you have indicators. So the, the basis states are still the unit vectors, the canonical unit vectors of the bigger state space. So indicator vectors. And the neat thing about the Kronecker product as well is that if you take the Kronecker product of indicator vectors, you will end up with, a in, with an indicator vector again. And if you write out the the states that these um, elements of the of the vector represent, then it's just as if you were to concatenate the states of the um, of the original state spaces. So you know this uh, this is the state one because we have a one here. This is the state zero, and then the resulting state, if you take the Kronecker product, will be one zero, which is this entry. So this is really neat. So you can just write it like this in binary. And this of course can be generalized. So you can write binary strings here and this is just a concatenation or a big Kronecker product over one qubit state spaces. And sometimes you even see that you just write it in decimal if n is clear from context. So just as a side note. Um, okay, now imagine we have a a two qubit system like here. So this is again, this notation, or I just, I haven't said this explicitly, but of course, if you have these operations, then you notate them with this box with the, with the matrix inside. So this stands for this operation applied to the, this initial state. And um, of course, if you have multiple qubits, you can perform operations on them independently so you have two, um, two by two matrices. And if you want to perform them in parallel, then this will be just the Kronecker product of both matrices. So you get this bigger matrix you, matrix, you put a copy of V after each entry of U, and then you get this huge matrix here. And this is also, this explodes in space requirement, requirement really quickly, so. Um, wide, but this is really simply the way you form bigger multi-qubit operations. So as a quiz question, what might this big operation here look like if you have three qubits? So how would you write this in terms of a Kronecker product? So I'm giving the answer right away. So you would of course have these two Kronecker factors here, the X and the X, but the third one, and this is, this is important to remember because the circuit notation is really just a notational device because unit matrices are always implicit here. So of course, if you have just a, a wire going through, then it's a unit matrix you have to multiply here. So the, the big um, operation U here is this X times X times I. Everything we have so far um, looks like this. We have matrix, uh, we have um, Kronecker products over um, single qubit operations, but um, which is a huge state space, but our qubits have not interacted. So if you imagine this like a graphical model, 
um, I thought this analogy was quite nice. If you have, a, if you imagine it like a like a graphical model with independent structure, then all of the qubits would be independent right now. But the actual um, Hilbert space is much larger than what you can reach with Kronecker products over single qubit operations. So there are much, there are many, many more matrices that are valid unitary matrices, but you cannot represent as Kronecker products of single qubit states. So the picture we have actually with our mathematical framework is this one, where we have a full connection between all qubits. So if you imagine it as, a, as one big clique of a, of a um, Markov random field, for example, then of course you also would have to write down all the two to the power of n um, what are they in, in MRF's um, potentials or something. Um, and we have a similar picture here. So we have this, this two to the power of n amplitudes. And we, but up to now, we haven't used the full potential. So we haven't used all the degrees of freedom we actually have. So what I'm going to show you next is multi-qubit operations. And this is where stuff really becomes much more interesting and weird. So, right, operations can involve multiple qubits. So we have this very famous gate, which is the controlled NOT gate, C NOT. Um, and what it does, if we just observe it with Boolean logic glasses, so to speak, is um, it's a conditional NOT. So um, if the first qubit here is zero, then nothing happens, then the second qubit is not touched. So zero one will result in zero one. If on the other hand, the first qubit is one, then the second qubit will be inverted. And this is, this is kind of reflected in the shape of this matrix because here up here, this is when the first qubit is zero, this is a unit matrix and this is the, the X matrix that we know from before. And this matrix cannot be represented as a um, Kronecker product of two single qubit states. So we cannot write this as two separate boxes. So what happens when we actually apply this now? So an interesting example that you'll often see is that we have something like, like this. We have two qubits which are initialized to zero. Then we apply a Hadamard gate. Remember, this is the gate that kind of tilts the qubit to its side. So zero becomes this equal superposition of one and zero. And then we apply the controlled knot. And this is really, again, to keep in mind, this is not Boolean logic, but we can apply this controlled knot to every weird in-between state as well. We just multiply this with this matrix. And if we multiply this out, so this is what it looks like. By the way, this might answer your question, uh, Sebastian, because here we have now two operations in a row and this is then a, a matrix product, simply. Or this might have to clear it up maybe. Then we end up finally with this state here. And I've just written again this, what, what the, um, the elements of this vector stand for, for which states. And uh, now I'd like to have an answer from you because what, what do we see now if we observe this state? What are the kinds of, of measurements? So intuitively, what would you say is happening here if we observe this? Anyone? So if I understand the question correctly, you're asking how, what, what states are the most probable, right? So zero, zero and one, one would be equally probable with one half. Right, so the probability for these two would be one half, but what is the implication of this, actually? It's an end operation, right? Um, kind of, yeah, you might see it this way, but... Um, yeah, but, but, but your input is fixed, so it's not actually calculating anything really, but it's... Um, okay. You have a fixed output, but okay. But what intuitively happens here, that is that these two qubits share the same state. So if the first qubit is a zero, then the, the other one will also be a zero. If the first qubit is a one, then the other one will also be a one. And this 
is the so-called Bell state. And we say that these qubits are entangled, which means that they share some kind of information. If you measure the first one, the result of the second one is determined. So if you just, if you apply this circuit to this initial zero state and you measure just one of the qubits, then you know that the other qubit will have the same value. And this is actually the thing that Albert Einstein called spukhafte Fernwirkung, which he refused, so, so spooky effect at a distance, which he refused to accept because this implies if you, if you entangle these two qubits with the circuit and then move them across the universe and you measure them, then the other qubit will be determined. And yeah, what, what really mathematically speaking entanglement really means is you cannot factor it into single qubit states. So you cannot find a Kronecker product that represents this very state. Because if you just look at this as a, as, as a system of equations, so you cannot um, solve this linear equation here if you think about it as, as such. And this means that this state is entangled. And yeah, states that are not entangled, you can call separable or product states. But at the end, everything is just a huge um, amplitude vector. So now, just to give you a bigger example, we have all the tools necessary to understand these, the, the bigger picture. So if you see a quantum circuit like this, you know, okay, these are just matrix operations in disguise. So you start with this as your initial state, and then you apply these, these, um, and you, of course, remember the implicit, um, the implicit identity matrices here. And then you, in matrix notation, you of course invert the order because you you apply matrix multiplication from right to left here. And then you can expand all of these to. Um, to actual um, Kronecker products. And of course, there are mathematical tricks. So if, you, if, you, um, if your control qubit and your target qubit are not adjacent, then you can first um, like swap single, um, you can basically rearrange the basis of your matrix and stuff. So it's all relatively, relatively straightforward actually to, to figure out the exact matrix operations that are behind these. So just as a big concluding example of how quantum circuits are made up. Uh, just a quick question. Maybe you mentioned that and I missed it, but if you want to entangle three variables, you would first do two and then on the resulting entanglement, you would do another one, right? Or can you yes, do yes. three at the same time also? Um, so there are there are higher order qubit gates. I don't know if there's a gate that entangle that creates um, maximal entanglement in one operation. I don't really know. I don't think so. But um, yes, you if you want to entangle three with the tools we have seen so far, then you would do it one after the other. Yeah. Okay. You would just then apply another C not gate. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. So now we have a toolbox of quantum operations and quantum states, and we know, we measure them, we observe probabilistic values, but what can we do now with it and what are people in, in research trying to do right now? So, and one approach to quantum machine learning um, um, comes from this notion which, which Felix actually touched on a minute ago, that if you measure a final quantum state, so if you run some kind of circuit from whatever initial state, you will observe um, probabilistic output. So, and you can think of this really as a, as a random variable, a binary random variable um, over some kind of um, arbitrary probability distribution, which is, defined through our circuit. And if you have real data or classical data, you can construct some kind of embedding 
And um, really one, one thing which is also important to keep in mind here is that, as I told you, quantum circuits are just one big matrix operation and this matrix is unitary. So what you're doing is if you have some kind of embedding into a quantum state, then all you can do with a quantum circuit is rotate this embedding some way in a weird high dimensional way. And then you can do a readout. So, so basically um, this is also one thing that, that researchers argue that um, most of the effort, or if you want to do something like classification or regression, or let's, let's say um, classification, then all the, the power of your model comes through the embedding actually. And then you just, with the quantum circuit, you can just align this such that it is like separable, for example, with a, within SVM or something like this. So um, this is what you can do as a data scientist, uh, as a data scientist with quantum circuits. And what people do in, in literature, um, so there are some more gates, which I should quickly mention. And if you want to get some data into this, there are multiple ways. For example, there are these so-called Rx gates, which have a parameter, and these, this parameter is um, a real number. And if you think back to the block sphere, these represent rotations around the axis that these, these gates specify. If you have an Rx gate of, with a parameter pi, then this would mean you make a, a half rotation around the x-axis of the block sphere. And um, this is a way that you can introduce data into a circuit. And there are also, there are also uh, multi-qubit variations of this. So this is one option. And um, what you end up with is a model you, that is called variational quantum circuits, which is basically just a quantum circuit with these parametric gates in it. And then you just collect all of these parameters into one big parameter. And this is something, because these are real numbers, that you can optimize with a classical machine learning um, pipeline. Um, just like this. So you could take some kind of data set, um, apply an embedding, run a parametric circuit, measure the outcome, and then you ha you'd have to define some kind of loss function here, which takes your, for example, your label and then the, the um, expected outcome. So if you measure it a million times, take the average, then you could calculate a loss function and adapt the, um, the parameter and plug it in again. And this, this way you would end up with a classical machine learning pipeline where the only quantum part is the actual model evaluation. And um, right, and people are, or have been trying to, to embed like um, SVMs and neural networks and all this buzzwordy stuff into, um, into quantum um, circuits. And um, now the question remains, what are actually the types of functions that you can learn with such a quantum circuit, with a parametric quantum circuit, what kinds of, um, how expressive is this kind of model with a given set of gates uh, or for a given ansatz as it's often called actually in literature. So an ansatz is nothing else than the shape of your quantum circuit or the, yeah, the gate structure, something like this. It's called an ansatz. Yeah, and this is something that I'm actually going to talk about next week where I'm going to show you a paper by Maria Schult, who um, investigated exactly this question of what types of functions can be learned from such a variational quantum circuit. And if we have enough time, I might also give some information about the paper that I've been writing together with the people from EIS, because we have used a slightly different approach, but uh, all of this next week. And that's it from me. <laughs> Okay.
So think... what you did uh, when you you did a lot of programming, um, as we have seen, with a nice uh, framework, or is that a given thing that everybody is using? Um, so what I use specifically for this for this demo is um, Kiskit, which is by IBM. So this is IBM's default Python framework for quantum computing. And this contains a simulator or multiple simulators, even they have multiple backends and also an interface to their actual IBM Q quantum computers that are mm -hmm. scattered all over the world. And this is what we actually use for our paper where we use this interface to, to, to evaluate experiments on actual quantum computers. Yeah. So this is really um, a popular framework. And is that easy to be used? It's relatively easy, actually. As you can see, you just define, I don't know if you, if it's big enough, I, like, perfect. Um, mm. So you can define this um, mm -hmm. simulator from back end. You create a quantum circuit with n qubits, and then you can mm -hmm. just add the, the, the operations here, one after the other at the end mm -hmm, measure, mm -hmm. execute, and then you get the results. So it's really straightforward, actually, yeah. Uh, the first question. Yeah. We had some issues uh, when we use Penny Lane in the science code slam. Is this thing here better um, to use? Um, yeah, right. In the in the science code slam, we use Penny Lane because I was just in the mood to try something different. Um, I think so. Um, Penny Lane, I think, is actually based partly on on Qiskit or uses some of the same backends. So if you have a penny lane model, you can actually access the, the underlying Qiskit circuit, which is just an attribute. So I don't really know. I just chose penny lane because it has these embeddings for, for machine learning. But then Nico said to me, okay, these are also in Qiskit. So I don't know. So yeah, but, just, but because, because we have mostly used um, Qiskit, I've stuck to Qiskit most of the time. Yeah. So you mentioned that uh, you have these parameters that you can use traditional machine learning methods on to optimize. So you would basically treat this whole quantum circuit as a black box and optimize over that. Yeah. So okay. you you only get, or at the end, you only, sometimes you would only read the output of a single qubit and calculate or simulate the expectation value over that and then interpret this as a label or mm. something or some some value and then you can you're trying you can try to adapt the um, the parameters and people do this using gradient descent actually so they use um, stochastic gradient descent and and stuff like this which um yeah uh, felix and me have made not very great experience with so we this was very slow when we tried it so, and what we used for um, our paper was actually um, evolutionary algorithms. So we, we had a loss function, and then we constructed a circuit using evolution, which is also really interesting and not many people are doing this. Um, yeah, but more or less it's a, it's a black box regarding the pipeline, yeah. Because from what we saw today, you, do you always have the same amount of input qubits as output qubits? So it, in the example earlier where you entangled the two qubits, your output was also two qubits. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you would like to do, I don't know, like binary classification, would you then just interpret one of these qubits as the label and uh, use that? Uh, to yeah, yeah. Yes, this is typical, a typical approach. So, usually, so these, the qubits that um, you don't really read at the end, you, you could just leave away this measurement symbol here and then you would just read out one of the qubits. So this is no okay. problem at all. And often for many, for many of the classical, um, of, the, of, the, of the traditional quantum algorithms, you introduce so-called ancilla qubits, which are just helpers. So you could imagine this like helper variables in a program where that you just need to store information for some kind and then you entangle them and do stuff with them. So it's typical that you that you just um, read out some of the qubits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
but what would you do if you have like a, um, a classification problem where the number of classes is not a, a power of two? So if you have two qubits, but only three classes, what do you do if, uh, if for example, one one isn't defined as an output, and but the, the black box gets out one one? What then you, you might just round it to the next power of two and ignore some of the combinations. So, okay. so this would basically be an, an I don't know decision. <laughs> Then. Yeah, so you could, <laughs> yeah. So, so my intuitive approach would be to just ignore some of the states or just just learn that these states are not desirable when optimizing it. Okay. Something like this. Right, you can regularize that with optimization, right? You can just penalize outputs that are very unlikely and this way try to make the circuit not predict those values. Uh, or in a very idealistic world where you have perfect quantum computers, you could just say you use one qubit for every class. Mm. And then you try to maximize the probability that the readout is one if it's this class, for example. Oh, okay. And then you would regularize that not multiple are one at the same time because you can't have multiple. Yeah, classes. for example, yes. Okay. Okay, cool. Okay, but about yeah. those variational quantum circuits, so what you have or what you face in the end is once again learning parameters, but also learning the the uh, the ansatz. Is that what you call it? I think you, you have to also learn where to place which gates, right? Um, yes, so most people when they do or when they try to use quantum computing for like classification and stuff, they use a fixed layout where they have like one layer of rotation gates, one layer of entanglement gates repeated, similar to a neural network. This is why they right. often call this quantum neural network because it looks good on a paper, right? But <laughs> has nothing to do really with, with um, neural networks. Um, yeah, so this, for this kind of fixed ansatz, you could then just calculate a gradient or, or um, approximate a gradient and learn it this way. But what we did for our paper actually was really learn the ansatz itself. So we, we uh, added randomly new gates and checked how the, how the loss value changed. Yeah. Okay. Could you also um, set up circuits that, uh, so, so here you have, you put the data in. Could you also put the parameter in and evaluate the gradient? Mm. So the parameters um, theta would be your data, basically. Yes, but yeah, yeah. The, the parameters are your data you can put in, right, yeah. Okay. More or less. And then you could just nudge them and see how the output changes. And then this way calculate a, a gradient, like with respect to one or calculate the gradient of the expectation of the output, mm -hmm. yeah? because it's probabilistic. You have to take like expectation of the output and then you could calculate a gradient. Yeah. You can also do this analytically, by the way, because as you have seen, the operations are not, um, not complicated, but um, it's just huge. The state space is just huge. So it's expensive to calculate this analytically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, your data is basically the, um, the, the parameters theta that you put in. Okay, and, and what now happens if you use a quantum computer for that, like you did for your paper with the IBM quantum computers, you don't run that simulation on the regular, regular computer and, and try to simulate the whole quantum circuit, but mm -hmm. you actually send the, the data and, and the parameters and all that to the quantum prototype computer and oh. like really run this as with, with quantum mechanics. Yes, so okay. quantum computers, they realize all this stuff what I mentioned at the beginning. So they have these um, super conducting particles and they shoot them with microwaves or whatever they do. And then um, at the end, you still get this probabilistic readout, of course you still have to run the, si same, the same circuit for a couple of thousand times to get this probability distribution right. approximation, but um, you don't simulate it. So you don't calculate any amplitudes. And uh, did it work first time or did you break it? Uh, 
the yes. our, our our program for the paper or what? Yeah, no, no just asking when you used the real quantum computer. Did so, it, okay. Like yeah, the they first said, time or. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, okay, yeah. It's yeah, a it, bit tongue and cheek question, but yeah. <laughs> it worked, yeah, but uh, so the it was the convergence was not was not as, as strong as um, in simulation because real quantum hardware introduces noise and errors and de and something called decoherence which is pretty pretty nasty because over time or if you repeat operations something like the bell state is quite unstable on real quantum hardware because over time if you apply more and more operations the entanglement kind of drifts apart again and at the end you everything is going to be independent again and there's a physical reason for that for that but uh, don't ask me about that so it's because some kind of micro interactions with the environment or stuff i don't know but um yeah there are a lot of error sources when dealing with real quantum hardware <laughs>